thought that you were interested in working with children. Yeah. I Well, I thought philosophy was too conceptual for me, and that it wasn't quite something I was going to really want to work in all my days, although I wasn't disenchanted with it, I must say, and I'm still not. And I applied to the Tavistock, who looked at me rather sceptically and said, well, you don't know anything about children. And I had to agree, yes, that was quite <laughs> true. <laughs> so I got a sort of provisional acceptance uh, on the condition that I spent the one first year no, not doing the training, but getting experience with children. And there were really two options. I could either get a job as a teacher's assistant or work as a nanny. And when I reflected <laughs> on these, I decided on the nanny, thinking this will put me into a family and really get some experience of what it's like to see uh, mothers, fathers, children. So I got myself some jobs as a nanny, not a living <laughs> nanny, a day <laughs> nanny. I did start my analysis that year. So I had my analysis and I, I really had, you know, two nanny jobs which mm. took up all the time. A lot, a lot going on. And a lot mm. going on, mm. it, it, mm. yes. Um, and I started the training only the next year. And I think both at the Anna Freud Centre and at the Tavistock, we were very fortunate in those days. First of all, we saw our training cases five times a week at the Tavi at the health, on the health service and the health service, no problem. And at both places, senior analysts were very happy to supervise us mm -hmm. because really child analysis then, not now, was at the forefront of discoveries in psychoanalysis, yes. ongoing <coughs> controversies and so of course analysts were interested and mm -hmm. I was very lucky as I think the people at the Anna Freud were also very lucky and I had Esther Beck for my little case, Betty Joseph for the latency, and Hannah Siegel for my adolescence. <laughs> <laughs> I had a good start. <laughs> How did you decide where to go, the Anna Freud or, or the Tavis? What made you...? Well, that's an yes. interesting question. Mm. Because I really, when I left philosophy, I didn't know anything mm. about Anna Freud or Melanie Klein mm. or Winnicott or anything else. I had read a lot of Freud okay. and I have to say it was my husband who is himself a philosopher and he'd read a lot of uh, psychoanalysis including Melanie Klein. He said to me, go for class. <laughs> and really it was not out of knowledge. And I think we all felt if you know you had to be loyal to your group and if you had an idea from somewhere else you felt sort of sheepish and disloyal. And I was the only Kleinian among, we were seven, uh, among independents and contemporary or classical Freudians as they were mm. called then and <clears throat> used to be what did in the end become a standing joke but it was quite serious every time I presented they'd all say oh but you talk too much <laughs> and every time they presented <laughs> I would think oh you don't say enough <laughs> I remember taking great offence myself at a Freud reading seminar when there was some, the, the lecturer, you know, asked, well, would anybody like to say 
uh, make a comment and what was the what happened to this particular concept in Freud's thinking. Nobody did in the end. I did, and the response I got was, "Oh, fancy you a client." knowing anything about Freud mm -hmm. and I was absolutely yeah. you know, mm -hmm. furious and incensed but I have to say I might have taken offence there and I'm pretty sure I myself gave offence to other mm -hmm. people in a also uh, a way of feeling well Klein's got it which you haven't, you know, that much more what I think of as a sectarian stance, mm. really. There's one's mm. own life yeah. at yes. stake, one's own psyche. Mm. Mm. And <coughs> we all have patience yes. mm. at the mm. end yes. of us. Mm. Yes. And the next day, you're going to work with mm. a patient. And we all have anxieties about what we do and our work, you know, doesn't just roll along conflict free, <laughs> uh, does it? And so of course there must be doubts, well, could I be, should I be doing this differently? Mm. Would another mm -hmm. approach yeah. with this patient really mm. facilitate things in a way that mm. I cannot? Why are we so stuck? And I think that's mm, absolutely yeah. right. The stakes are very high, yes. both for one's own analysis and consequentially for the work we mm. will be doing ourselves. The stakes really are high. Do we believe there's more than one way of doing psychoanalysis well? Mm -hmm. Or not? Yeah. <laughs> Because I think what I'm calling the more sectarian atmosphere thinks I've got the only way. Mm. Mm. Uh, mm. And Which if. It's very limiting, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Mm. And if we are in a state of pluralism, which plainly we are, then there is more than one way. Mm. Mm. But yes. not. Everybody, talking of personality, mm -hmm. you can see, actually believes this. And, you know, I think myself that it's a time in psychoanalysis of letting things be, not forcing things. We won't sort all this out. They're complicated issues. It's terribly difficult comparative psychoanalysis, I think, yes. really. And it seems to me more useful to let people be, forget our three boxes. I mean, it seems to me something quite tragic that the contemporary Freudians are now, as it were, a tiny group. This is ridiculous and not appropriate to where we really are if we have to give ourselves labels, these old boxes don't really fit anymore. Mm. And somehow, but it's not easy, you know, genuinely to accept a kind of plural way mm. that I think psychoanalysis actually is in. Mm. And whether we are going to have one language, one psychoanalytic language, and one psychoanalysis, well, you, the future, you will know. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. And child analysis, um, you know, was, there was such an optimism yeah. about it. And people often, I think, <coughs> laugh nowadays at Melanie Klein, who used to say, everybody should be psychoanalyzed prophylactic psychoanalysis, yeah, yeah, yeah. the world would be different, and perhaps it would. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> we all know this won't sadly yeah. happen. And I had then a, a private practice of child patients, mm -hmm. and I worked, uh, I was going to work at the Tavistock 
but then got a job at the Institute of Education mm. instead. And that was a very interesting setup. It was Susan Isaacs uh, who mm. established this department in the Institute of Education mm. and it was meant for teachers and they came for a year to do two things, to you know, improve curriculum and all that kind of thing and also deepen their understanding of the child. Mm. And it, mm. Susan Isaacs had it, Ilza Hellman had it, Francis Tustin mm. as they had it, because it seemed to be mm. sort of bequeathed. Mm. I don't think it was advertised. I was rung up, would you be interested? And I said, wow, I certainly would. Mm. So I worked there for about 13 years, actually. I found a fascinating experience. Mm. Mm. So that was about the, um, the application of psychoanalytic ideas and thinking mm. to the, these young people who were teaching. Yeah, and I also learned a lesson there, because for the, I asked, is there a syllabus? No, no, if you find your own way, everybody does here, or I find my own way. In the beginning, what I did the first couple of years, and what I was told was give them some idea of what child psychotherapy is like, so they'll be willing to refer children. And I approached it much more, talking about child psychotherapy, from that angle, and understanding children in that way. And I began to realise this was no good. And at least I'd had the sense, I kept a little notebook of people's questions. Mm. And in the third year, I jettisoned what I'd been doing and decided to start from the other end, mm. the, where the teachers mm. were, mm. their questions, mm. and got it differently organised so that you know, after a lecture or two, they were to take it in turn to present a problem in the school, in, in the class, mm. and that was much, much mm, better. That mm. And that also mm. told me something, you know, you can go about it from the wrong mm. end, mm. and that you've got to start really. And they were terrific. Mm. Uh, hadn't read any psychology, so not stuffed up with all sorts of wrong things, <laughs> and with a vast, wonderful experience of children. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You have to know yourself, don't you? And we can never really know ourselves enough, I think. And you, I don't know, um, you need to, well, be on one set. If you've got no stomach for anxiety, he told us in our vows, you, you're in the wrong profession. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's something Gosh. standing anxiety. Mm -hmm. And there's something like a sort of psychological imagination. I don't know what the right word is. Uh, because it isn't the patient says A, B, C, and you interpret, you know, A, B, C to me or to you. It's not like that. It does call for something. And, well, not everybody can fly aeroplanes and not <laughs> everybody can be a psychoanalyst. Um, How does it affect my life? My husband always tells me, I can always tell when you've gone back to work. <laughs> You're much lighter, freer in the holidays. <laughs> it is, I think, a bit of a fighting moment for psychoanalysis, really. Uh, but, you know, the pendulum swings. Mm. And now mm. it's all quick fix, mm -hmm. CBT, give us a manual. Mm. Yes. And that's just the way you can't do 
psychotherapeutic work that will have a long-term mm. effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as all of us who say work uh, in the health service will know, a lot of, say, CBT patients, they come yeah. back. Yeah. And I don't know yes. why this bit of evidence doesn't get put on a flag <laughs> and waved about mm. more. <laughs> but it will be. And I think we'll have our doldrums mm. and we must um, keep uh, our conviction, which is based on our kind of evidence, <coughs> and not be rattled into wanting to prove ourselves by other means, yes. but we've also got somehow to communicate with mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Uh, and maybe it's not only our problem in communicating, perhaps they don't want to listen. and. I don't know how we are to overcome this, mm -hmm. but I, I, I don't mm -hmm. think it will get wiped out. Mm -hmm. After all, psychic reality is a corner of nature, a yeah. real corner, yeah. and it's weird and strange, but who says nature isn't weird and strange? You know, if you start mm -hmm. thinking about atoms and photons and electrons in the face of our solid tables, well, look at us, we've got equally <laughs> strange, <laughs> bizarre objects and this is and that is going on, but it's a fact that it's there. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite hopeful now, mm -hmm. have to leave it to you folk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so shall we close there then? Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.